Last week, uh, you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Last week for Resurrection Sunday, we had a simple message on grace and salvation, and I didn't want to make it too complicated. We talked about the resurrection and what that means, what that tells us about ourselves, what it tells us about the Lord. And uh, today we're also going to take a really simple approach to the Lord's Prayer, a simple message on the Lord's Prayer. It's right here on the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, Christ is sitting down on that mountainside and uh, giving this amazing sermon out that's uh, been recorded for us in the scriptures. And uh, today's topic is really cool because it's basically how, how should we pray in Christ saying, well, here's, here's how you ought to pray. Have you ever, uh, I mean, i glad you're all here, but have you ever asked yourself why you're here? Uh, why did you get up out of bed this morning? I, these are comfortable chairs, and I know it's possible to sleep here, but it would have been probably easier to sleep. Why, why, are, you, why are you here this morning? Today we're going to talk about uh, lordship, lordship, honoring the Lord as Lord in our lives. Now, uh, I'm one of those people that tends to avoid the term lordship because I don't know so much anymore, but growing up, maybe uh, 70s and 80s and around there, there was a lot of like legalistic connotations. Like it's people who talk about grace and people who talk about lordship. And so we're a grace church and we're all about grace. And so so sometimes I tend to avoid that phrase, but uh, I think we're going to see today that lordship is all about grace. It's all grace. And when we honor God as Lord, that frees up grace to, to work in our lives. So let's, uh, let's get to it. Matthew chapter 6. And you can uh, follow along with me. I'm going to be reading the uh, first 14 verses, but then we're going to focus specifically on the Lord's Prayer today, but I'm reading around it to give it context. So these are the words of Christ, and he's talking about religion. So you're at church today, presumably, at least your body's here, and uh, that's kind of a religious thing to do, right? So Christ is talking about religion. What does he say? Jesus says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness. You know, do your do-gooder stuff. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not, uh, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, and, and I'm, I'm kind of wondering if they really actually did blow trumpets and have a little procession, look at how we're giving, or Christ is just kind of using hyperbole and saying, listen, it's like you're blowing a trumpet to draw attention to yourself whenever you give or, or do something. And he's saying, don't do that. That's hypocritical. Uh, people do that just to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, those people who do that have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And again, obviously he's talking figuratively there because hands really don't know anything. They pick up something hot, I suppose. But uh, it, it's, he's saying you don't have to proclaim it all over the place every time you do something good. Just let that be between you and the Lord. Uh, verse 5. And when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Uh, truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full because why are they praying? Well, they're praying so people can think, oh, that person's religious, that person's spiritual. Uh, they're drawing attention to themselves. So people who don't love Jesus and actually hate the Bible love to quote that verse to prove that Christians shouldn't pray. Uh, in church or in public, and uh, that's because the reason they say that is because they don't love Christ and they hate the Bible, 
and they're clueless. It, and imagine that. Uh, they don't understand what the Bible's teaching here, and we're going to see that in context shortly. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Again, we're not praying to draw attention to ourselves. We're praying to talk to the Lord. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because there are many words. Uh, we don't have to say the same prayer over and over and over again, meaningless repetition, which interestingly, we're studying the Lord's Prayer today. Some people think it's like a magic prayer. I mean, there are people who just say the same words over and over and over again. And in context, Christ says, hey guys, don't say the same words over and over and over again because pagans do that and they think they're going to be heard because they say the same words over and over and over again. Do not be like them. Okay? Guys, does anybody ever hear, have any trouble praying? You're supposed to pray. We're supposed to pray. Let's pay attention to what Christ is saying. He's saying, don't just say the same things over and over again. It's not a magic phrase. That's what pagans believe. Uh, don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need even before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Notice he doesn't say, this is the magic phrase that you're supposed to repeat again and again. He says, this is how. It's going to be like this. This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then uh, yours might say something about for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And then put an amen there. Uh, there are some old texts, and I don't want to get off track, but I, we tend to deal with all the difficult stuff in here, so why stop now? There are, there are some old texts that actually do have that in there, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. That's a phrase that was used among uh, Jewish Christians and the early church. Uh, it's seen in, in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Uh, well, I'm not sure where it's seen right now, but it's one of the two Corinthians. Uh, uh, Paul uses this exact same phrase. And, uh, and it's certainly true, for you is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever, amen. But it's also not found in, in most of the ancient documents. And so there's two possibilities. One is a scribe was copying and he just skipped it at one point. Or what seems to be more likely was that was a common way to end prayers at that time. And so uh, since this was being used as a doxology in the early church, somebody just wrote it in not intending it to be considered part of Scripture, but saying, here's what we're going to do. We're going to end it by saying, for years, the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Either way, it's uh, certainly uh, a biblical thought, and it, it would be okay to say it either way. But uh, if you're wondering why your Bible doesn't have it or why your other Bible does have it, that's why, and it's, it's okay. Uh, yesterday, uh, I don't know if everybody heard this, but a very famous pastor named Rick Warren, he wrote, he wrote that book, The Purpose Driven Life, uh, also a, a companion book, The Purpose Driven Church. Uh, very famous author, one of the best-selling books of, of all time, uh, a wonderful philanthropist, uh, giving away millions of his own money, millions and millions of dollars to help people in the United States and in Africa and around the world. Uh, a real heart to help people. A pastor of a church out in California, they have 20,000 people at their church. So that's, that's a big church. Uh, he lost his youngest son, age 27, and they're still, they're going to do an autopsy and everything, but apparently to suicide. And uh, immediately, people online are, are very rude, very mean, uh, people were being cynical and using this as an opportunity to say things like, uh, well, where was God? Why didn't Jesus save him? I guess his religion didn't work. And, and uh, on a conservative website, people were saying, uh, Rick Warren is just uh, a progressive liberal anyways, and so this is what happened to his family. And uh, Mean-spirited, mean-spirited. And by the way, if your worldview causes you to kind of celebrate 
somebody else's child committing suicide, perhaps there's something wacky with your worldview. Just leave it at that. If anybody thinks that way, please rethink. Uh, he and his wife had spent the day together with their son all day, and uh, then he went home, and again, apparently, he, he shot himself. Earlier that day, I guess, his, I guess his son has always struggled with depression. Depression is a bear. Uh, struggling with depression since, uh, well, since he was a, a teenager. And 10 years ago, he had told his dad, and his dad shared this. He said, uh, my son said, Dad, I know I'm going to heaven. I believe in Jesus. Can I just die and end this pain? And uh, so Rick Warren put out a sh brief, brief uh, message, and I believe he did this because he, he knows the way the world is going to say, see, there's no God in this. But he, he put it out to see. To, he praised his son, praised his son's kindness and intelligence, and he said, uh, and I'm very grateful that after he said that to me 10 years ago, we got to spend another decade together. But earlier in that day, I think before he knew what was going on, what had happened, I'm not sure exactly on the timeline. You know how these things are. They're kind of fuzzy. He tweeted, we pray thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. Since in heaven, God's will is done always. On earth, it's done rarely. And it's not just the messed up world. Husbands and wives, when's the last time you said something nasty or kind of sharp or uncalled for with your spouse? Will of God not being done, right? Those of us, uh, uh, those of you who have uh, close friends or, or, or in the workplace, when's the last time you thought an unkind thought about somebody else in the workplace? or a neighbor, or a friend, or a relative. The will of God not being done. How about lust? How about greed? How about impatience? How about self-righteousness? Will of God not being done. Don't you think, uh, don't you just hate religion? <laughs> the, uh, the outside tra traping of religion. Get dressed up, polish ourselves off, sing songs, act religious, and uh, inside it's just rebellion against God. Nobody's going to talk to me that way. Somebody overlooks me and I just hold on to bitterness. Start nursing a grudge. You ever think about nursing these precious little babies we have all over our church? Beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful things, a mother nursing a child. Life going into life and growing. And nursing a grudge is mean I'm pouring my soul, my spiritual life into this little grudge demon so it can grow and grow and have more power over me. See, nursing a grudge is not a beautiful thing. It's a nasty thing. When I nurse a grudge, the will of God not being done. How easy is it to be very critical of other Christians or other churches or other movements? And Meanwhile, Christ, before he went to the cross to die for our sins, was talking about unity again and again and again and again. But I find it easier to be critical. So who am I? i got to be true to myself. I'm a critical person. It would be false of me to keep that in. I need to be honest. Just let her rip. And the will of God is not being done because the will of Dan is being done. And the will of Dan is no good. I expected to hear more amens, but I appreciate that. Thank you. Again, Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Pray then this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have 
uh, forgiven our debtors, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I was praying. I woke up and I prayed for uh, River Hills this morning. Last week was last week was Easter Sunday. This week you're kind of getting back into the grind. But where's Pastor? Well, he's in heaven. That's comforting to know. But what about us? I was praying for a Saddleback. That's a big, huge church of twenty thousand people. Uh, I prayed for them several times over the years, and you know they've never reciprocated by praying for us. That's okay. But uh, <laughs> what sadness and heaviness of heart. We were, uh, this last summer I'd lined up a bunch of wonderful guest speakers, and we were supposed to have this speaker uh, come in who's uh, struggling with uh, well, he was struggling with cancer, and uh, yet he was living out his life for the Lord and he even went on a missions trip. Isn't that beautiful? Struggling with cancer. He didn't have much strength, but he went on a missions trip. And his, his whole message was about, it's not about me, it's about God. I need to lay down my life. I need to honor God. Well, it didn't work out. And a couple, not long ago, he's passed. Well, he's with the Lord. He is healed. He is rejoicing, uh, but we missed out. <laughs> that what a powerful message! I, I'm, I'm, uh, what do you call that? Uh, jealous for my church. I wish this body, this flock, had gotten to hear his testimony. I sent it out by video. If uh, if any of you got a chance to see that, I don't. It wasn't too long, like ten minutes or something. But. Uh, this world can be a very dark place. I don't want religion that has a plastic face and you, you crank somebody up on the back and they and they just, there's this false effervescence and there's this, oh, it's so bubbly and, and uh, I don't have time for it. I've got important things to do. I would rather watch baseball. Uh, than be around a false, pointless, hypocritical, deceptive Christianity. I've, I've run into people, and I love them. They're my brothers. They're my sisters. I believe they will be with me in heaven. But their face will be swollen. Their horse, voice will be hoarse. They're coughing. They're hacking everywhere. And I say, oh, do you have a cold? No, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke that. I am not sick. I deny it. And I ask him, does God need you to lie in order to glorify himself? Usually they don't have an answer for that. I want real. <laughs> I want something authentic. I, I'm, I'm really messed up. I need a real God. Uh, I was sitting in here this morning in Sunday school class and then during the worship service and I was looking around, and my thought was, man, I love these people. I love each and every one of these people. They're dear to me. I cheer for them. I know a lot of the things that are going on. Some things you haven't shared with me. Some things you have. I know what's going on, and my heart breaks. And you know what? I believe that's the Holy Spirit. I believe God has, has given us a joy for one another, a love for one another. We cheer for one another. We don't want to tear each other down. We... But there's my natural self, and then there's the self that God's working on. This, uh, this world can be a dark, dark place. That's, that's the real world that God came into. That's the Christmas story. It's not a good, happy world that God came into, and now, I don't know. The world can be a very sad place. I think sometimes living in a land like the United States, we're so blessed, so incredibly blessed. Uh, really want to challenge you. If you can't be happy when you've eaten at least one or two meals a day, 
when you've got some warm clothes, you have shelter, don't tell yourself the lie that you'd be happier if you were eating a little bit better food, wearing a little bit better clothes. You wouldn't be happy then either. You would not be happy. Well, I'd be happy if I wasn't sick. Well, then you, I was sick this week. That was miserable. <laughs> uh, but you know, after you get well, you feel happy about that till you get used to it again. And then you find stuff to complain about. Or then your, your spouse is sick. Or your aunt is sick. Or your aunt's best friend is sick. Or, or somebody named Matilda thrice removed. I don't know. Uh, we're always, always, always in a fallen world full of sickness, full of death, full of nastiness and sin. You don't have to go very far to find something to be miserable about. All of us can be miserable. But in the United States, there's actually so much glitz around and so much wealth that even our poor often will have a telephone. Even poor people uh, can it can often have access to public transportation. Uh, in the United States, it's often there's so much entertainment, so much around us that we can forget, or, or we can at least try to stay occupied enough to forget that death looms, that, this, that there's hardship in this world, that there's trouble. And so we can almost get into a mindset, uh, we can get into a mindset where uh, it's like the purpose of my life is to avoid reality. Now, that seems like that should be a non-Christian thing to do. Oh, they're not facing reality. They don't see their sin. They don't see God. Uh, and so all they're doing is trying to keep busy about entertainment. Don't think that the clock is ticking. Death is coming. Don't think that when they die, everything they've done will be pointless and meaningless. That, that even if it goes to the next generation, it won't go in to the next generation. That life ultimately is empty and void. Uh, and so we think, well, that's a... But you know what? Christian brothers and sisters, we do it too. We do. We don't do it, uh, you know, we're, we're a little theologically sophisticated, so we don't do it in the same way. Uh, but we go to church and we pray, and it's like, Lord, I need to avoid suffering. I need to avoid hardship. I, 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 I need to avoid crying. I need to avoid depression. Uh, all of these things, and, and we just... Our, our whole life is to avoid the reality that the Bible is very open about. The Vibe Bible, we said last week, would be a dark place, a dark book, if it wasn't for the coming of Christ, his death for our sins, the resurrection. Jesus Christ died because we're sinners. We're wicked. We're wretched. We're messed up. We're ornery. Jesus Christ said, I'm going to take care of that. And you are forgiven completely. And it's okay. Come to me. He puts his arms around us. He envelops us with forgiveness, and it's okay. And you know who doesn't get to experience the joy of forgiveness? The person who is living in unreality, denying what's on television and what's in their soul denying the news that's out there and the news that's coming from their own heart. The Bible is a very honest book. And it would be a dark book, except for the fact that God loved us so much he did something about it. Things like suicide, cancer, uh, fevers, the flu, death, divorce. You know what? I hate divorce. And I'm not alone. The Bible says God hates divorce. I hate it when two people intertwine their lives together, become one, they're spiritually united, and then it's ripped apart. Uh, depression. Who likes depression? <laughs> Nobody likes depression. But sometimes that becomes so much a part of who we are, it becomes our identity. You know, what have, what have I said before about the sin of homosexuality? Uh, we're not going to compromise with the world. The, the Bible says that premarital sex of all kinds, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, it's, it's all sin. Uh, this is the truth. Uh, but Jesus Christ died on the cross to bring us forgiveness. And what if I said that the real, 
The real danger of sexual sin is when we internalize it and identify it. Well, uh, I'm just a man, so that's the way I am. So now it's my identity. Well, how can I deny myself? I was born this way. And so what does that mean? Now it's my identity. And how can I deny myself by repenting of it? See, it's insidious because it denies us the cross. How about a woman who's a prostitute? It's my body. I can do whatever I want with it. It's mine. Instead of saying, oh, Lord God, God, forgive me. I'm messed up inside. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. Thank you for paying for my sins. I need forgiveness. I need this love. Instead, it's, this is who I am. You will not touch me. And we cut ourselves off from grace. It's not legalism. To say, God, you are Lord. It's, it's grace. Because I come before him and say, you're the Lord. I'm not and I'm going to lay down my burden. I've been carrying this burden, trying to be my own king too long, saying, this is my life, I'll do what I want. But I'm just going to lay it down before you, Lord, because your ways are better than my ways. And we find grace. Lordship is not legalism. It's about grace. I follow the, the news uh, well, we'll go back to that list. Suicide, cancer, death, divorce, depression, anger, frustration, disappointments. Uh, the older we get, the more we realize that some of our dreams are probably more than likely not going to come true. The things that we thought we were made to do, the things I put on my planet. Everybody that goes on American Idol says, I was, I was put on this planet to, to sing, and, and I believe this is my time, and, of course, only one person wins a year. Uh, Disappointments, failures, failure is no fun. See, it's almost easier when other people are being jerks. But when the person we're disappointed with is not out there, but what is in here, oh, that's really hard. Have you ever been there? It, you know, it's so easy when we can externalize it all the time. My trouble is because of those people over there. My trouble is because of people who dress like that. My trouble is because of people of that color. Or my trouble is because of conservatives. Or my trouble is because of liberals. Or my, tro my trouble is right in here. I'm being real with you. Those folks out there, they can be wacky and loony. And they are. But they don't throw me off track. It's how I respond. And when I'm responding in my flesh, in Dan Wolf's selfish nature, again, the will of God is not being done. We see the Lord's prayer here is all about the will of God. I follow the news every day. Uh, year after year, I was in grade school and I was... I didn't want to talk about anything except for the conflict between China and India at that time. I mean, I've, I've always been into world affairs, into the politics, into the news. I follow the news day after day, year after year, and I can promise you this. The human race is broken. In all this happy, clappy stuff, that we are the world, let's come together, it's a, is, is delusional. We're selfish, we're vindictive, we're petty. Again, Looney Tunes. I'm part of it. I'm, I'm part of the human race, despite some uh, uh, of things that have been said before. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, amazingly, amazingly, given, given what's on the news, and given what we face when we look in the mirror, we still have this capacity in this mind up here somewhere it is is foolish and silly of, as we have been in our lives we still have the capacity to think you know what i think i should be god okay right now you're thinking oh, i've never said that i'd never say that yeah i don't believe you <laughs> when god says thou shalt not and you say yeah but 
this person is really irritating me. What are you saying? You're saying, God, no, I, I think I know better than you this time. Every time we say, oh, I know uh, God has called me to this kind of life, but I'm so frustrated, I'm so depressed, I'm so angry, what are we saying? I think I'm going to be God instead of God. I know what I'm talking about because I do it all the time. God says, don't do this. And I'll say, I don't think that really pertains to me. Isn't that hubris? Isn't that silly? Why in the world would somebody who's only been alive for some decades think that I would know better than God in heaven? Well, it's because broken people have broken thoughts. We think that we should go sit, that we should send God to go sit in the backseat. Jesus is my backseat driver. Jesus is my co-pilot. If that's true, you're in trouble. That's not just arrogant. It's downright kooky. It's not just that we don't trust God enough, but somehow we look at our own lives and we look at what's going on in the world and we think, hey, why don't we make our own rules? Why don't we decide what's moral and what's immoral? And that's, that's the whole thing. And I, and I hate harping on homosexuality because if you don't struggle with that sin, it's so easy to fall into the greater sin of spiritual pride and look down at people who do. But I'm going to bring it up again because it's in our news all the time and it's, going to, it's, it's an issue that Satan is going to use to drive a wedge between you and this. Because society says it's okay if two people love each other, who cares? And God says it's a sin and you've got to repent, otherwise you're not going to know grace. And if I start to believe what the society says, that means this is no longer my authority. It's really not about sex. It's about who's going to call the shots in my life, who's the authority. God has the right to tell me, Dan, Sex outside of marriage, sex before marriage, uh, it's wrong. Lust is even wrong. Jesus says, even look at a woman with lust in your heart, it's a sin. So what does that cause me to do? It causes me not to sit around feeling self-righteous. It causes me to get down on my knees and say, I'm a person in need of a Savior. Thank God he loves me. He knows everything and he loves me and he draws me. And, call. and so... So we want to extend love and grace to everybody, no matter what they're struggling with, but we will never, ever, ever, if we love God, if we love God rather than the praise of men, we will never, ever, ever close this book and say, you know what, I'm looking at our society and I'm looking at the crime rate, I'm looking at the divorce, I'm looking at all the children that get aborted for convenience sake, I'm, I'm looking at how even good friends have a hard time staying together. I'm, I'm looking at how much pain we cause. I'm looking at the starvation. I'm looking at all the fallen governments and all the wickedness. And boy, I think we know what we're doing. Let's call moral shots for ourselves. I just spit. Uh, let's, let's, let's just make up our own rules about morality. Uh, boy, that's, that's not smart. Why don't we decide what's moral and immoral? God, we really like you. Hallelujah, praise Jesus. Uh, why don't you just go take a rest? You, you know, you, you earned it. You've been so busy listening to all those prayers from the people buying the lottery tickets. I don't think you really have time to decide what's right for me. I've got to be true to myself. I've got to do my own thing. So uh, we don't uh, want God to decide what's right or wrong anymore. We, we got that covered. Uh, telling lies, what do we say? Telling lies, well, it's for their good. Telling lies, well, it would have caused a lot of trouble. Telling lies, it's just a little one. See? God says, thou shalt not lie. And we say, yeah, but I think I got this one, God. Have a seat. You've been great, really. Gossip? I needed to share this so people would know what to pray about. Bullcrap. 
I was just telling my friends, I was just telling my friends their names so that they could be more aware. Why do they have to be aware? Are they going to be part of the solution? They do not need to be aware. If something happens in here, it doesn't need to go everywhere. Unless, again, there's going to be, they're going to be part of the solution. Premarital, extramarital sex, again, our sins. Oh, give me a break. Everybody's doing it. God is so old school that maybe he's a little out of touch. Uh, what's next? Are you going to tell me that getting drunk is a sin? Come on. Cussing somebody out is a sin too, right? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, I suppose God doesn't have enough on his plate running the big old universe that he cares if I shoplift a piece of gum. Actually, yes. Because God running the big old universe is still madly in love with you and he knows don't take stuff that's not yours, it's bad for you. It's not only wrong, it's not only wrong to other people, you're messing with your own soul. Don't take stuff that's not yours and God does care. It's a sin. But religious people, we don't get drunk. We don't use swear words. We, we don't uh, shoplift. Uh, we, we don't ever tell a lie. Oh, uh, spiritual pride. <laughs> Maybe a little bit, because I'm not like those people. Being judgmental. I may be judgmental from time to time, but, uh, you know, uh, I would be less critical if people just agreed with me more. Self-righteous. Now, I claim I have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but every time I'm trying to be right in myself, that's self-righteousness. Whenever I start to act like that, this critical, self-righteous, judgmental thing, I get this mental image in my mind. Now, uh, uh, I'm going to be a little crude here. I used to weigh uh, 265, 268 pounds or something, so I had a bigger butt at that time. Uh, now, I, I've lost quite a bit of weight, so I've got a smaller backside. Uh, but I get this mental picture. Whenever I'm being very critical and, and self-righteous and and, and just indignant and getting offended easily and, and just being critical of other people, I imagine myself with my little tiny, oshiri is the Japanese term, sitting on the mighty throne of God. That's his chair. That is not my chair. God will judge. And he actually doesn't even need my help. And so I need to stay off of that chair. Religious people, we have a temptation to be very self-righteous, critical, judgmental, hard-headed, and difficult. That is not what Jesus Christ has called us to be. Don't try and put our little behinds on the throne of God. Our butts are not big enough. That's his job. It's a sin. Sin. And I'll, I see a lot of you nodding your head and agreeing with me. And you know why? You know why you're agreeing with me? Because God's been good to us and he's been showing these truths to us. And, and it's right here in this book. It, it, God says he'll be the judge and we're not supposed to be. And we say, yeah, that's right. And so even though we're tempted to do it, God's changing us on the inside. And we're saying, I don't want to be like that anymore. And that's why we're nodding our head and agreeing because the Holy Spirit is working in us. That's evidence of God working inside of us. And, when, and when, when God says, love everybody, including your enemies, we don't say, well, we're starting to learn to say, God, I really do want to learn to love people, even if their political views are way different, even if their <coughs> lifestyle is, is totally contrary to your scripture. I want to love them, God. I want to, I want to love them and serve them and, and be a blessing and, and be their friend. And God, I... When people see me, I, I hope they see your love. Let's go out there and love people and, and love each other in the church too. I love to love our spouses. Let's love our kids. This book is a wonderful book, but you know not everybody believes it, right? Uh, Brother Frank 
led uh, Band of Brothers yesterday. And by the way, uh, Band of Brothers is phenomenal. Every Saturday, not every Saturday, once, uh, let, me get, let me erase what I just said. We usually meet the first Saturday of every month, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. If you are a man, or if you hope to aspire to be a man at some point, I strongly encourage you to join us. It's where the men are at. And uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Frank did a, a phenomenal job with Francis Schaeffer's stuff yesterday. We're watching a video series. It's going to be good. It was spectacular yesterday. I wish more of us were there. And one of the things that Schaefer pointed out was that when a person became a Christian in the Roman Empire, they became opposed not only to their culture's gods, but they were also opposed to the entire culture upon which, uh, the entire culture based upon those gods. What are the gods in our modern culture? Materialism? Popularity? I mean, we could name a bunch. We've got to reject the gods. Facebook uh, can be a tool for good or bad. We've got to reject uh, the false gods of our culture. Christianity is at heart being countercultural, and that's what the uh, Lord's Prayer is about. As the Apostle Paul put it in Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he, he wrote this, of course, after the birth of Christ, the ministry of Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection. So we're eagerly waiting for what? If you're a Christian, what are we supposed to be eagerly waiting for? Second coming. Second coming. Because that puts this life in perspective. We may be the generation that doesn't die because Christ comes back during our lifetimes. But if he comes back tomorrow or if we get in a car crash on the way home from church, let's not waste our lives pouting. Let's not waste our lives bitter. Let's not waste our lives complaining. Let's not waste our lives holding on to grudges. All of these things where our will is being done instead of the will of God. Uh, today in America, we really would like to keep God for grace. God's good for grace. But reject his rule over us. But the sad thing is, think about this. Everybody, follow with me, track with me right now. If God doesn't determine what is good and what is evil, if it's just a cultural thing or a personal thing, then we wouldn't need the cross. Jesus would not have had to come to die for us. We wouldn't need Jesus, and we would have no need of grace. Did you see what just happened there? I start off by saying God's good for grace, but we reject his rule. And we say rule, that's that lordship thing, that's that legalism thing. But you get rid of God's rule, and we also lose grace. Did you see how that happened? We need the cross because... We need salvation. <clears throat> no, no uh, God doesn't call shots. God does not determine what's right and wrong. No need to be forgiven. We simply declare everything we in our culture to do to be just fine. We don't need to repent. Our nation doesn't really need to repent. I don't need to repent. We're fine. Let's look at how Jesus taught us to pray again. Our Father. The word there is Abba. It's related to, it's not exactly the same, it's related to the word Papa. It's personal. It's close. Jesus said, this is the way I want you to be when you pray. It doesn't have to be flowery. You don't have to use special language. Our Papa. But where is our Father? He's in heaven. Where are we? We're down here. So right away, Jesus says, when you pray, I want you to understand this intimacy, how much God loves you. He loves you like a father. When, when you get scared, you run to daddy. <coughs> when you mess up, the best thing in the world is to have dad put his hand on your shoulder and says he still believes in you. He's still there for you. <coughs> but we understand God's closeness, but we also understand his transcendence. Isn't that beautiful? The theological depth Christ wrapped up in that opening phrase. God is close and God is transcendent. We are fallen. We're mortal. We're in this mortal plane. We're messed up. But God 
reigns in heaven. Hallowed be your name means, God, we honor you. It's not about us. It's not about our culture. It's about you. Again, so we start off, God's in heaven. He rules. Second, hallowed be your name means you rule. <coughs> Isn't it funny that Jesus said, pray this way, uh, Lord God, my Aunt uh, Bertha hit, stubbed her toe again this week. Uh, he didn't say, uh, pray this way. Uh, oh, Lord God, I really need to, I, God, I really, boy, you wouldn't know what the lottery would mean to me. <laughs> uh, all the ways we often pray, and I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for Aunt Bertha's toe, I th- or Bertha or Bertha, I don't remember what she said. Either way, it's, it's okay. But if our, prayer, if our prayers are only and always praying about sicknesses and illness and all these things that go along with life and We're only always praying to get stuff and to avoid pain and hardship and all this stuff. We're not praying the way Christ taught us to pray. Uh, Keith Green has this beautiful song where, where he said, Jesus died to go save the world. We can't even get out of bed. And he says, and all you do is pray and ask me to bless you again. He said, when are you going to be blessed enough to go out and start loving people? Good song. Uh, Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Bless me, Lord. Our Father, again, that's a good prayer, but if that's only what we're praying about, it's wrong. Our Father, Papa, who is in heaven, you rule. Hallowed be your name. You're the boss, not me. Your kingdom come means I want your rule in my life. Did you follow that? Your kingdom come. God, I'm so messed up. I need you to start ruling in my life because I go places I shouldn't go. I think things I shouldn't think. I say things that are so repulsive to to you, Lord, and, and they repulse me. Your kingdom come, but you know it means even more than that. Christ is teaching us to pray for the second coming right here. This is about the kingdom of God coming into its fullness when heaven invades our planet and there's going to be no more sickness and no more sorrow and no more death. Say, God, Lord, we're hurting down here. Your kingdom come, Lord. We look forward to your second coming. We, we, we look forward to it. We anticipate it. We desire it. And we're waiting And the Bible ends by saying the spirit and the bride together are saying, Lord, quickly come. This is Christianity, to live my life in anticipation of Christ coming again when the world is set right. So, brothers and sisters, are you angry? Are you frustrated? Are you suffering with depression, broken hearts, broken dreams? Guess what? It's okay. And I think sometimes we make such a big deal about, uh, about these things. Lord, I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. Lord, I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to be sad. And we're missing out on the grace of, you know what, it's okay. Life is hard. And I love you. And I'm coming back again. He's riding like that knight on a white horse. And he's going to come and pick us up and say, you were made for something better. Let me take you away from this. So we don't have to sit down here and turn on our fake masks and pretend that everything's okay when God says, it's not okay and I'm coming. It's not okay, that's why I died. It's not okay, but a better day is coming. God's dealing with reality and we're pretending. There's another great Christian song that says we're playing marbles with diamonds. God's given us diamonds and we settle for marbles. C.S. Lewis said it's like, it's, it's like, God wants to take us on a, on a vacation to a beautiful place with a beautiful beach by the ocean, and we'd rather play in the mud. We're missing it. We're missing out. Lord, your kingdom come, because I can't wait for everything to be right. When, things, when there's justice and fairness and goodness, your will be done on earth just as is in heaven, and God, let it start right here. Brothers and sisters, can we pray that together? God, your will be done, and let it start right here. Because, God, if your will was being done in my heart, in my life, in my family, in my church, in my nation, that would be good. (laughs) Yeah, that would be good. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, because I'm not very bright, that didn't... uh, mean a lot to me. That didn't resonate with me for 43 years. I've been a pastor. I've been a missionary. Uh, I'd read that and i think, oh, God, all this great stuff in here, and then give us our daily bread. 
because I realize now I'm just learning to enjoy depending on the Lord. It's dependence. Lord, I'm afraid today. That's okay. I'll give you what you need to get by today. Lord, my situation's a mess. That's okay. Pray. It's okay to depend on our daddy to take care of our needs. I'm starting to really like this one. <laughs> give us this day our daily bread and thinking of our physical food and our spiritual food. And I'm, I'm just... It's an admission. I need you, Lord. I need you. I, I don't have all the answers. I don't have everything in him of myself. You are Lord, and I'm coming for you because I, I know you're good. And that's grace. And I'm dependent. And God, give us this day everything we need. I, I pray that for you, sisters, brothers, everything you need, physically and spiritually. May Lord bless you with that today. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts. God, forgive us as we also have forgiven our debtors, uh, our forgiveness doesn't hinge on perfect obedience. But I want you to pay attention to this really, really well. Uh, a wrong attitude will disqualify you from grace. Well, I thought God's grace covers everything. Yeah, but guess what? If you have an angry vindictive attitude, you probably don't want grace. A hard, bitter person who doesn't care to extend grace and forgiveness to others is also the kind of person that's very unlikely to fall on their face before God, confessing their own sin and asking for grace and mercy. The people that are really, if we're really hard on others, it's probably because we're not confessing our own sins to the Lord. So yes, our attitude can remove us from a place of grace and mercy. Ephesians 4.32 puts it another way. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. I like that. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Get it? Be kind. Be tender-hearted. Forgive one another because God's forgiven you so much. This is an offshoot, but uh, I think I just love it when, when people are trying to be nice to one another. That's really awesome. The last part of the prayer, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this is a confession of weakness, a confession of his strength. You know, Christ didn't need to pray this kind of prayer. Father, forgive me. He didn't need to pray, don't lead me uh, into evil, because Christ didn't, knew, did not sin. But we need to pray, God, please save us from not only the wickedness on the outside, save us from the wickedness on the inside. Everybody, uh, we all know a different version of the Lord's prayers, but I'm going to ask you to just repeat after me so it's not too totally chaotic today. Uh, just please stand with me. And... Uh, Let's close by, by repeating the Lord's Prayer together. So I'll say it and then just echo it using the version from the New American Standard Bible that I'm using. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You can be seated.
Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.